Hi everybody, um, picking back up with Harry Potter, I'm on page 166 and there's been an attack at the castle and um, the fat lady that guards the Gryffindor Tower wasn't in her picture and she had been attacked and somebody had tried to break into Gryffindor Tower and they think it's Sirius Black and they've searched Hogwarts but they can't find him so that's where we are now. The school talked of nothing but Sirius Black for the next few days. The theories about how he had entered the castle became wilder and wilder. Hannah Abbott from Hufflepuff spent much of their next herbology class telling anyone who'd listened that Black could turn into a flowering shrub. The fat lady's ripped canvas had been taken off the wall and replaced with the portrait of Sir Cadigan and his fat gray pony. Nobody was very happy about this. Sir Cadigan spent half his time challenging people to duels, and the rest thinking up ridiculously complicated passwords, which he changed at least twice a day. He's a complete lunatic, said Seamus Finnegan angrily to Percy. Can't we get anyone else? None of the other pictures wanted the job, said Percy, frightened of what happened to the fat lady. Sir Cadigan was the only one brave enough to volunteer. Sir Cadigan, however, was the least of Harry's worries. He was now being closely watched. Teachers found excuses to walk along corridors with him, and Percy Weasley, acting Harry suspected on his mother's orders, was tailing him everywhere like an extremely pompous guard dog. To cap it all, Professor McGonagall summoned Harry into her office. With such a somber expression on her face, Harry thought someone must have died. There's no point hiding it from you any longer, Potter, she said in a very serious voice. I know this will come as a shock to you, but Sirius Black, I know he's after me said Harry warily. I heard Ron's dad telling his mum. Mr. Weasley works for the Ministry of Magic. Professor McGonagall seemed very taken aback. She stared at Harry for a moment or two, then said, I see. Well, in that case, Potter, you'll understand why I don't think it's a good idea for you to be practicing Quidditch in the evenings, out on the field with only your team members. It's very exposed, Potter. We've got our first match on Saturday, said Harry outraged. I've got to train, Professor. Professor McGonagall considered him intently. Harry knew she was deeply interested in the Gryffindor team's prospects. It had been she, after all, who'd suggested him as seeker in the first place. He waited, holding his breath. Hmm. Professor McGonagall stood up and stared out of the window at the Quidditch field, just visible through the rain. Well, goodness knows I'd like to see us win the cup at last. But all the same, Potter, I'd be happier if a teacher were present. I'll ask Madam Hooch to oversee your training sessions. The weather worsened steadily as the first Quidditch match drew nearer. Undaunted, the Gryffindor team was training harder than ever under the eye of Madam Hooch. Then, at their final training session before Saturday's match, Oliver Wood gave his team some unwelcome news. We're not playing Slytherin, he told them, looking very angry. Flint's just been to see me. We're playing Hufflepuff instead. Why? chorused the rest of the team. Flint's excuse is that their seeker's arm's still injured, said Wood, grinding his teeth furiously. But it's obvious why they're doing it. Don't want to play in this weather. Think it'll damage their chances. There had been strong winds and heavy rain all day, and as Wood spoke, they heard a distant rumble of thunder. There is nothing wrong with Malfoy's arm, said Harry furiously. He's faking it. I know that, but we can't prove it, said Wood bitterly. And we've been practicing all those moves, assuming we're playing Slytherin. And instead of Tufflepuff, and their style's quite different. They've got a new captain and seeker, Cedric Diggory. Angelina, Alicia, and Katie suddenly giggled. What? said Wood, frowning at his light-hearted behavior. He's that tall, good-looking one, isn't he? said Angelina. Strong and silent, said Katie, and they started to giggle again. He's only silent because he's too thick to string two words together, said Fred impatiently. I don't know why you're worried, Oliver. Hufflepuff is a pushover. Last time we played them, Harry caught the snitch in about five minutes, remember? We were playing in completely different conditions, Wood shouted, his eyes bulging slightly. Diggory's put a very strong side together. He's an excellent seeker. I was afraid you'd take it like this. We mustn't relax. We must keep our focus. Slytherin is trying to wrong foot us. We must win. Oliver, calm down, said Fred, looking slightly alarmed. We're taking Hufflepuff very seriously. Serious. The day before the match, the winds reached howling point, and the rain fell harder than ever. It was so dark inside the corridors and classrooms that extra torches and lanterns were lit. The Slytherin team was looking very smug indeed, and no, none more so than Malfoy. Ah, if only my arm was feeling a bit better, he sighed as the gale outside pounded the windows. 
Harry had no room in his head to worry about anything except the match tomorrow. Oliver Wood kept hurrying up to him between classes and giving him tips. The third time this happened, Wood talked for so long that Harry suddenly realized he was ten minutes late for defense against the dark arts class and set off at a run with Wood shouting after him. Diggory's got a very fast swerve, Harry, so you might want to try looping him. Harry skidded to a halt outside the defense against the dark arts classroom, pulled the door open and dashed inside. Sorry I'm late, Professor Lupin. I... But it wasn't Professor Lupin who looked up at him from the teacher's desk. It was Snape. This lesson began ten minutes ago, Potter, so I think we'll make it ten points from Gryffindor. Sit down. But Harry didn't move. Where's Professor Lupin? He said. He says he is feeling too ill to teach today, said Snape with a twisted smile. I believe I told you to sit down. But Harry stayed where he was. What's wrong with him? Snape's black eyes glittered. Nothing life-threatening, he said, looking as though he wished it were. Five more points for Gryffindor, and if I have to ask you to sit down again, it will be fifty. Harry walked slowly to his seat and sat down. Snape looked around at the class. As I was saying before Potter interrupted, Professor Lupin has not left any record of the topics you have covered so far. Please, sir, we've done bogarts, red caps, kappas, and grindy lows, said Hermione quickly. And we're just about to start... Be quiet! said Snape coldly. I did not ask for information. I was merely commenting on Professor Lupin's lack of organization. He's the best defense against the dark arts teacher we've ever had, said Dean Thomas boldly, and there was a murmur of agreement from the rest of the class. Snape looked more menacing than ever. You are easily satisfied. Lupin is hardly overtaxing you. I would expect first years to be able to deal with red caps and grindy lows. Today we shall discuss... Harry watched him flick through the textbook to the very back chapter, which he must know they hadn't covered. Werewolves, said Snape. But sir, said Hermione, seemingly unable to restrain herself, we're not supposed to do werewolves yet. We're due to start hinky punks. Miss Granger, said Snape in a voice of deadly calm, I was under the impression that I am teaching this lesson, not you. And I am telling you all to turn to page 394. He glanced around again. All of you, now. With many bitter sidelong looks and some sullen muttering, the class opened their books. Which of you can tell me how we distinguish between the werewolf and the true wolf? said Snape. Everyone sat in motionless silence, everyone except Hermione, whose hand, as it so often did, had shot straight into the air. Anyone? Snape said, ignoring Hermione. His twisted smile was back. Are you telling me that Professor Lupin hasn't even taught you the basic distinction between... We told you, said Parvati suddenly. We haven't got as far as werewolves yet. We're still on silence, snarled Snape. Well, 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 I never thought I'd meet a third-year class who wouldn't even recognize a werewolf when they saw one. I shall make a point of informing Professor Dumbledore how very behind you all are. Please, sir, said Hermione, whose hand was still in the air. The werewolf differs from the true wolf in several small ways. The snout of the werewolf, that is the second time you have spoken out of turn, Miss Granger, said Snape coolly. Five more points from Gryffindor for being an insufferable know-it-all. Hermione went very red, put down her hand, and stared at the floor with her eyes full of tears. It was a mark of how much the class loathed Snape that they were all glaring at him because every one of them had called Hermione a know-it-all at least once, and Ron, who told Hermione she was a know-it-all at least twice a week, said loudly, You asked us a question and she knows the answer. Why ask if you don't want to be told? The class knew instantly he'd gone too far. Snape advanced on Ron slowly, and the room held its breath. Detention, Weasley, Snape said silkily, his face very close to Ron's. And if I ever hear you criticize the way I teach a class again, you will be very sorry indeed. No one made a sound throughout the rest of the lesson. They sat and made notes on werewolves from the textbook while Snape prowled up and down the rows of desks, examining the work they had been doing with Professor Lupin. Very poorly explained. That is incorrect. The kappa is more commonly found in Mongolia. Professor Lupin gave this 8 out of 10. I wouldn't have given it a 3. When the bell rang at last, Snape held them back. You will each write an essay to be handed in to me on the ways you recognize and kill werewolves. I want two rolls of parchment on the subject, and I want them by Monday morning. It is time somebody took this class in hand. Weasley, stay behind. We need to arrange your detention. Harry and Hermione left the room with the rest of the class, who waited until they were well out of earshot, then burst into a furious tirade about Snape. Snape's never been like this with any of our other defense against the dark arts teachers, even if he did want the job, Harry said to Hermione. Why has he got it in for Lupin? Do you think this is all because of the bog art? 
I don't know, said Hermione pensively, but I really hope Professor Lupin gets better soon. Ron caught up with them five minutes later in a towering rage. Do you know what that... He called Snape something that made Hermione say, Ron, is making me do... I've got to scrub out the bedpans in the hospital wing without magic. He was breathing deeply, his fists clenched. Why couldn't Black have hit it in Snape's office, huh? He could have finished him off for us. Harry woke extremely early the next morning, so early that it was still dark. For a moment, he thought the roaring of the wind had woken him. Then he felt a cold breeze on the back of his neck and sat bolt upright. Peeves the poltergeist had been floating next to him, blowing hard in his ear. What did you do that for? said Harry furiously. Peeves puffed out his cheeks, blew hard, and zoomed backward out of the room, cackling. Harry fumbled for his alarm clock and looked at it. It was half past four. Cursing Peeves, he rolled over and tried to get back to sleep, but it was very difficult now that he was awake to ignore the sounds of the thunder rumbling overhead, the pounding of the wind against the castle walls, and the distant creaking of the trees in the forbidden forest. In a few hours, he would be out on the Quidditch field battling through that gale. Finally, he gave up any thought of more sleep, got up, dressed, picked up his Nimbus 2000, and walked quietly out of the dormitory. As Harry opened the door, something brushed against his leg. He bent down just in time to grab Crookshanks by the end of his bushy tail and drag him outside. You know, I reckon Ron was right about you, Harry told Crookshanks suspiciously. There are plenty of mice around this place. Go and chase them. Go on, he added, nudging Crookshanks down the spiral staircase with his foot. Leave Scabbers alone. The noise of the storm was even louder in the common room. Harry knew better than to think the match would be cancelled. Quidditch matches weren't called off for trifles like thunderstorms. Nevertheless, he was starting to feel very apprehensive. Wood had pointed out Cedric Diggory to him in the corridor. Diggory was a fifth year and a lot bigger than Harry. Seekers were usually light and speedy, but Diggory's weight would be an advantage in this weather because he was less likely to be blown off course. Harry whiled away the hours until dawn in front of the fire, getting up every now and then to stop Crookshanks from sneaking up the boy's staircase again. At long last, Harry thought it must be time for breakfast, so he headed through the portrait hole alone. "'Stand and fight, you mangy cur!' yelled Sir Cadogan. "'Oh, shut up!' Harry yawned. He revived a bit over a large bowl of porridge, and by the time he'd started on toes, the rest of the team had turned up. "'It's going to be a tough one,' said Wood, who wasn't eating anything." Stop worrying, Oliver, said Alicia soothingly. We don't mind a bit of rain. But it was considerably more than a bit of rain. Such was the popularity of Quidditch that the whole school turned out to watch the match as usual. But they ran down the lawns toward the Quidditch fields, heads bowed against the ferocious wind, umbrellas being whipped out of their hands as they went. Just before he entered the locker room, Harry saw Malfoy, Crabbe, and Goyle laughing and pointing at him from under an enormous umbrella on their way to the stadium. The team changed into their scarlet robes and waited for Wood's usual pre-match pep talk, but it didn't come. He tried to speak several times, made an odd gulping noise, then shook his head hopelessly and beckoned them to follow him. The wind was so strong that they staggered sideways as they walked out onto the field. If the crowd was cheering, they couldn't hear it over the fresh rolls of thunder. Rain was splattering over Harry's glasses. How on earth was he going to see the snitch in this? The Hufflepuffs were approaching from the opposite side of the field, wearing canary yellow robes. The captains walked up to each other and shook hands. Diggory smiled at Wood, but Wood now looked as though he had lockjaw and merely nodded. Harry saw Madame Hooch's mouth from the wor form the words, Mount your brooms! He pulled his right foot out of the mud with a squelch and swung it over his Nimbus 2000. Madame Hooch put her whistle to her lips and gave it a blast that sounded shrill and distant. They were off. Harry rose fast, but his Nimbus was swivering slightly with the wind. He held it as steady as he could and turned squinting into the rain. Within five minutes, Harry was soaked to his skin and frozen, hardly able to see his teammates, let alone the tiny snitch. He flew backward and forward across the field, past blurred red and yellow shapes with no idea what was happening in the rest of the game. He couldn't hear the commentary over the wind. The crowd was hidden beneath a sea of cloaks and battered umbrellas. Twice, Harry came very close to being unseated by a bludger. His vision was so clouded by the rain on his glasses, he hadn't seen them coming. He lost track of time. It was getting harder and harder to hold his broom straight. The sky was getting darker as though night had decided to come early. Twice, Harry nearly hit another player without knowing whether it was a teammate or opponent. Everyone was now so wet and the rain so thick he could hardly tell them apart. With the first flash of lightning came the sound of Madame Hooch's whistle. Harry could just see the outline of wood through the thick rain, gesturing him to the ground. The whole team splashed down into the mud. Okay, that's it. I ended on page 176. See you next video.